let's see on YouTube. Hello, everyone. In the meantime, hello, Sebastian. Nice to hello. see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> exactly. Not so, not so many uh, months ago, we have um, we have stopped producing .NET uh, diagnostic experts. So I watched a lot of hours with you. <laughs> <laughs> so now uh, re we, we we can repeat. Okay, I see that we are live. So I will just leave the preview to have. Uh, preview what, what what's happening on YouTube. Hello everyone once again and if you are watching us now just say hello from where you are because uh, we are always interested from what parts of the world uh, we are you, you are watching us like maybe from some uh, that are hotter than <laughs> today now in Poland because we have not so awesome weather today here. And that's all. Like today we are covering the topic how to become a diagnoser. So Sebastian will be talking about that. Uh, if you don't know, Sebastian is one of our one of our authors of course course, which is called Diagnostic Expert. So the link you see, uh, you can go, you can watch what's there. It's all about diagnostics uh, in .NET. So the question how to become a diagnoser seems to be a perfect question to you, Sebastian, because this is on from your experience uh, that you have tried to put in the course itself. But now maybe you can give us kind of recap how to become a diagnoser. What does it really mean? And so on. I will try to interrupt you. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> You're a diagnoser so too. You can, like... you can, you can speak. You, you, you have prepared some slides. You have prepared some short demos. So maybe without further ado of me talking, uh, I will just change the layout a little bit to have better preview of slides. And this scene is yours. Okay, so we were <clears throat> we were uh, talking with Conrad before this webinar. What? what it should be about. And uh, we decided to uh, maybe focus on something lighter than usual. So not uh, dig dive in, into. There are already seven or several webinars dedicated to these topics. But today it will, we, uh, I would like to present you a, a bit lighter uh, topic, but I think also very important because uh, uh, the the way how uh, if you if you want to become a diagnoser or better at, at diagnostics there are several steps which uh, mm, uh, you could follow and uh, in this talk I decided that I will list them at least of course that's from my experience so that might differ different people might have different um, opinions on that but I just wanted to give you some guidance uh, which subjects are necessary and. Uh, which um, steps to take to become a better diagnoser. So uh, let's start uh, maybe with first answering the question, why should we spend time learning diagnostics uh, in the first place? There are uh, m a few reasons, uh, but of course, the first one is that uh, we want to understand and Mon fix issues. And uh, earn money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that <laughs> that also. Uh, we want to understand and fix issues in application, and of course, not only applications, because when, uh, as we, you will soon see, if you're uh, good at diagnostics, you probably will also uh, you, you probably should be also uh, able to diagnose uh, parts of the operating system. Another. Um, uh, reason is that uh, the learning diagnostics and diagnostics tools help you understand the insights of applications and, as I said, also the operating system. Because operating system is just, we might think of it as just another application. Of course, much more complicated, but uh, it's also running on the same CPU and it it's uses uh, hardware. Uh, then. Uh, the other reason is that we want to become, with the understanding of the insights, uh, we are becoming a, a more aware developer. So uh, we understand what is happening under uh, the hood, what our, what our application is in fact doing, what are the libraries doing in our application. And uh, finally, with this knowledge uh, of insights and um, uh, the tools, we 
are gaining confidence in diagnosing even production issues. So when we know the tools, when we know how to play with them, we immediately uh, are not scared to uh, access uh, production and perform uh, troubleshooting uh, there as well. And of course, on our local system uh, too. So what are the steps to uh, become a diagnoser? Uh, to become a diagnoser, and I will list them here, and we will focus on which are uh, which of on each of those steps during the presentation. So may I, may I just interrupt you? So yeah. in general, by diagnoser, I we more understand persons that are able to diagnose things even on production, right? And right. not yeah. only to debug with the help of step over and step into. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, yeah, so yes, much, debugger. More, much more powerful. Uh, skill set. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's it's, awesome. it's, uh, we, we could say that a uh, troubleshooter that could be <laughs> another name for uh, for um, for that. Uh, and uh, Conrad already mentioned, but uh, if you have a, any question or you would like to add something, please write a comment in YouTube, and Conrad uh, will be monitoring them. Right, Conrad and. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll stop and, and answer. Definitely. That. Interrupt yeah. us. We will gather the questions. I will interrupt you with questions or maybe at the end. We will see. But do not hesitate to ask them. Yeah. So uh, the steps to become a diagnoser or troubleshooter. First of all, you should know your environment and also the application environment. And I will uh, cover that a bit. As I said, I will cover it uh, in more details in just a moment. The next thing is you need to un, uh, learn uh, or know how to monitor the operating system itself. Then you need to understand how to monitor the application runtime. So if you are a .NET developer, you need to know the tools to monitor uh, and troubleshoot a uh, .NET runtime. Uh, it, all, it is also worth and uh, very helpful to know the popular network protocols, how they work, uh, what, what, they, what the data they contain, how they are built. Um, then uh, you also need to learn how to use a debugger. So debugger is a crucial part of uh, or a crucial tool for a troubleshooter. And uh, you, you need to be uh, quite fluent at using a debugger. Uh, you need to feel the debugger, you need to know what the debugger can do and uh, uh, what you can achieve with uh, the debugging uh, commands. Then uh, it's really important to have your diagnostics tool belt. So uh, tools that you like to use and you know how to use them. Uh, so you have experience with them and uh, you feel safe about copying those tools to the production and uh, using them there. And uh, in a, in a, later, I will show you my tool belt and maybe that will inspire you to, uh, to your own, uh, to create your own uh, tool belt. But that's very important. Then uh, you need to also know and uh, how and where to search for information. As, as you know, there are a lot of sites and uh, places where uh, we can find information. And of course, we usually start from Google, but uh, it's worth to have a, a sort of habits of, and, and places that you trust. And of course, automate them in some way that uh, this search process is, is, is is faster during the troubleshooting. Finally, <laughs> of course, be curious and patient, and that's that's really important when you are when you are troubleshooting a problem. Then, uh, and I will also cover that later. It's very important, uh, in my opinion, to make notes during the troubleshooting uh, and have uh, a sort of style of notes, and uh, then store them somewhere uh, in an indexed form so you can search through the notes that you already collected and uh, later use them in uh, future uh, assignments. And uh, finally, publish or present your findings. And I'm not talking here about big publishing, but uh, even talking to uh, a few people about uh, your findings is, is very helpful. But let's let's talk about it a bit later. So let's uh, start uh, with uh, the first point, which is know your environment. So what mm, should we know about OS? Uh, well, we, we need to uh, know how to read and modify system configuration. And I'm not talking about Windows specifically. That applies to any system that you're using. It also, for example, Linux, FreeBSD, MacOS, or, or any other system. So network settings are really important. How to find information about DNS configuration, IP configuration, uh, TCP stack, and, and so on. 
So those settings are in each system, they are in different places. They could be scattered, like some of the settings are in files, some of in the registry or uh, in some different folders. Then um, some could be uh, handled by some service, like for example, when we have system D on Linux, then uh, it might handle some of this information and uh, we need to interact with it to change it. Then uh, this configuration, it's also very important for, for example, available space, mounted drives, uh, the IO settings and so on. And then uh, process and system security. So you need to be aware how to configure access rights to uh, on the um, uh, file system level, but also to on the processes or on the services. There are various places and objects uh, in the system that could have uh, user access rights assigned, and you might uh, need to modify them, uh, or you might uh, see an errors, access denied errors, for example, in the trace logs, and that. If you know how to change the security settings or the policies, for example, you will immediately know why this error happens and how to fix it. And finally, of course, we have environment variables and global system settings. Mm. So for example, the ETC folder on Linux or uh, the registry on Windows where uh, there are so many different configurations that of course it's impossible to learn them all, but with time you will mm, know the places where uh, to look for those settings and how to uh, configure them. Sebastian, I must say that uh, that looks like very nice slide and you are describing all these things and okay, that makes sense. But I I just remember the, the pain of <laughs> every of such scenario and why I was really pushed to use all of those things like someone could think okay but who would care about let's say this configuration or the NS configuration but I literally remember those hours spent to try to diagnose specific problems so really when you start to have a this kind of a role in your company that you may start to be responsible of doing such things or saying opposite because you will know it you will become a responsible for doing this then out of a sudden you will see that this is really something that you will really need like yes, dns exactly. and why things don't connect or some problems with space and limitations access rights all this is really something that then you need to out of a sudden start to learn how the hell it is implemented in particular operating system. So a kind yeah. of a funny, fu funny thing, like I'm seeing this slide and all those hours of pain. <laughs> yeah, and the namespaces and C groups, all that makes things even more complicated mm. because of these additional layers. But uh, yeah, at least uh, we must be aware of those basics <laughs> yeah. to, to just be able to find this information. And uh, another, another important, uh, and at least in my opinion, another very important point is uh, to have a favorite shell and also learn a bit about the default system shell. So for example, when you're uh, accessing a remote machine, which is Linux, but normally you work on Windows, have some ba basic knowledge about Bash or uh, I, any other shell that um, uh, this Linux by default is using. But on when you're on your own system, so for example, I'm working on Windows mainly, uh, uh, and uh, PowerShell is my, shell of choice and i feel i don't i wouldn't wouldn't say that i use powershell <laughs> very fluently but i feel a uh, quite good uh, in this environment and i try to automate stuff which uh which i do so for example when you're do, doing uh some analysis in the debugger or tracer you copy uh, copy the um, things that you extracted from the debugger into some text file, for example, and then uh, you uh, need to um, well process them. Of course, you might write an application in C Sharp uh, or any other language. Uh, and now we have these scripting possibilities for C Sharp, but basically a shell is something that you launch immediately. There are lots of uh, 
various commands which are especially useful when you need to encode or decode strings, fil uh, filter the strings, and even can work with binary uh, data. And PowerShell is cool for .NET developers because we, <laughs> we could use the uh, .NET API in PowerShell. That's quite uh, easy. Uh, and um, uh, so learning the shell uh, commands and uh, the, the usage of shell is uh, quite important. And let me show you uh, my profile uh, on, on Windows. I will talk about other tools that I use in just a moment. But uh, I have, <laughs> with time, I was working on various modules that I use and I still uh, work, uh, I mean, I still uh, add new commands to it. So my profile right now contains lots of different commands. As you can see, it's almost 600 lines of PowerShell. Some of them I use, uh, still use. Some of them are <laughs> really old and uh, crappy ones, not, not really used anymore. Like for example, the ASP.NET events from ASP.NET Framework. But I have a bunch of uh, tools that I uh, like. So for example, I have the format number command, which I sometimes, uh, oh, sorry, format uh, number, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, RPC uh, um, got in. So uh, for example, I have, uh, it, it, it shows something similar to what uh, WinDBG is doing in, uh, with the formats uh, command that we can use there. Uh, I also uh, like to <laughs> work, I mean, I often work with hex, hexadecimal uh, layout. So I also prepared a, a simple command to print it nicely. So for example, I have uh, maybe not, here, but let's go to the presentation folder. Uh, uh, it should be, it should be here. No. Okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so if I go to um, uh, slides, oh come on, uh, slides. And if I take content as byte stream and will take this presentation, and uh, I have a tool which I can, oh, actually I need to save it to byte array. So we have a byte array, and then I have a tool that provides pretty print for a byte array. And you can see that, that this output resembles uh, what, uh, well, different uh, hex editors show. I also have a uh, other tool for, uh, 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 sorry, I have also other commands like uh, read event log that shows event log uh, in real time. So maybe there's nothing now, but uh, if any event uh, appears in the event log, it will print it. So it just runs in a loop and uh, shows uh, those uh, new events that come. So it, in, in, in a, it's source of a tail command uh, in, uh, that we use in Linux to uh, wait for uh, an event log. Event log. And um, uh, so uh, the next uh, the next thing is uh, monitoring. And uh, the, uh, we'll start with monitoring the operating system. So we have uh, we have uh, various tools that we can use for um, the operating system monitoring. And, but before we can use them, we need to uh, know some things about the basic operating system architecture. So uh, which uh, layers compose the operating system? What's the kernel? What is user mode? What is a driver? Just some basic stuff. So for example, when this, there's a Windows internals book, the first two chapters are, or actually the first chapter is uh, the thing that I'm talking about. So just a, a sort of an introduction into the operating system architecture and uh, the various parts which the operating system is built from. So when you look at the process list, for example, you will know at least, uh, you, you will be able to guess what those processes are doing and uh, uh, why, For if, if there's this process consumes too much CPU, then you will know which part of the system uh, is problematic. And uh, <clears throat> the tools that you need to know, uh, so those basic tools that you need to know for uh, monitoring are the ones which provide you with information about the CPU usage, IO usage, uh, memory usage. So for example, when there is an extensive swapping done by the system, 
but of course, this memory usage, uh, we also want to know uh, the CPU, I.O. memory usage is split by the processes. So we can find the processes which consume uh, most of the usage as well as the total uh, CPU usage on the system. Then comes the network usage and configuration, which I already mentioned. So we want to know uh, what are the open ports, uh, where the data is coming from and uh, to, and uh, uh, how we can track the services that are uh, commun communicating. And uh, the very important part are also system logs. So we need to know how to read them, where to find them. And that, uh, unfortunately, that differs again between systems. So for example, on Windows, we have this event log. On uh, Linux, we used to have uh, most of the logs in the var log uh, folder. Now, they uh, quite often they are accessed with the journal CTL command. So those are the things that a uh, troubleshooter needs to know. So when it, you get to the system, that's what you basically check first when there's a problem. You see that you check the system logs. If there's any any clues, what could be uh, going wrong with the uh, system itself. And a very important point is also to learn uh, and to experiment um, how the system behaves when a process crashes. So when there's an unhandled exception in the process, what the system, operating system does, are there any services that are handling this, uh, this sort of a crash? And uh, is there any uh, lock in the system lock or maybe other place where we can find information about the uh, uh, crashing process. And that's uh, that's very important uh, to, to know. So that's what I usually do when I need to uh, check, a, for example, a specific distribution of Linux. <laughs> I, I like to check first if the way how they collect the memory dump is the same or they have invented something else. So that's, that's something that um, uh, uh, it's always worth to know. Uh, the next part is monitoring the application runtime. And as I said uh, uh, previously, as a .NET developer, we are interested in a .NET uh, runtime. So uh, again, we need to know the building blocks, but that applies also to development. So when you're uh, an experienced or uh, actually when you a .NET developer, you need to know what's the loader, what's GC, how, how it works, what are the threads, tasks, and so on. So this is the, the knowledge that uh, you acquire while developing software, but uh, it also helps you when uh, you're troubleshooting. And um, uh, the next uh, are the tools for monitoring. And in .NET, uh, we have a bunch of them. And for example, .NET Trace, which is for collecting traces. And I also created a .NET uh, WeTrace. That's a, I guess that's a command which is easier to use than .NET Trace and provides the logs in uh, in real time. Of course, uh, it, it's rather for uh, the first look what's happening in the process. So you might have a look at it if uh, to see if it's helpful for you as well. Then we have .NET counters, which provide uh, uh, statistics for a .NET process, also in live mode. And uh, from uh, some time, we also have .NET Monitor, which is capable of doing uh, var providing various uh, uh, stats about the process and can also uh, perform uh, the tracing, so can create a trace file and also the memory dump. So uh, that, that those are the tools that uh, you will need to know. And of course, there is if you're coming from .NET Framework, then we have also Perview and a lot of other tools that <laughs> uh, I, I haven't mentioned, but for .NET Core, those uh, here are uh, quite important. And we also have tools for uh, memory dumps, but uh, uh, that's uh, I, I connect them rather with debugging, not really uh, monitoring. And mm, so uh, the next uh, point uh, are, uh, uh, except, uh, handled exceptions in uh, in uh, um, our applications. So what um, again? It's like with the operating system. We need to know how the runtime behaves when an unhandled exception happens. So for example, on Windows, there is an event, a message, um, or actually a lock in the event lock. Uh, so we will see that .NET uh, application failed. We could see the uh, .NET stack uh, and uh, 
that's uh, that's one one thing that happens automatically uh, uh, and ad there are additional things that we can can configure through environment variables for example so we could force uh, .NET runtime to do some actions when we uh, configure it uh, in the operating system so the, those are the things that we also need to learn and uh, find about uh, how to how to configure the runtime or how it behaves when uh, when there is an unhandled exception. Uh, so that's like with the operating system. And uh, the next uh, slide is about uh, the network protocols. And I already mentioned that we should be familiar with the ones which are uh, the most common. So, uh, for instance, uh, if we have an application which is doing any networking, then uh, we we. I'm sure it will use one of those uh, uh, protocols from the network on tra or transport layer. So uh, IP, uh, ICMP is rather for troubleshooting, but then we have TCP and UDP. And uh, I have seen uh, many, mm, uh, in many uh, situations, I, I've seen uh, developers doing uh, running ping to check uh, why an HTTP service is not running. And this could be right uh, for checking if the system is running, of course, assuming the IECMP protocol is enabled. But uh, it won't tell you if there is anything listening on the port uh, 80 or uh, uh, 443, so the TLS one. Uh, and uh, to check that, you need to use other tool, which is for uh, uh, Mm, which is for sort of pinging about the TCP protocol or the UDP protocol. So on Windows, it could be PS ping. On uh, Linux, it could be Netcat. So something that will show you that uh, the, it is possible to perform a TCP handshake with a, a remote host. Only then you can tell that, okay, there is something listening on that port. And uh, uh, of course, you, it, it's also crucial to know the difference between TCP, UDP, where one, why TCP is the streaming protocol, what's the TCP session, and uh, and so on. So, uh, <clears throat> and I'm not talking about reading RFC. Also, sometimes uh, it's it's uh, it could be helpful, but there are uh, great books and articles which uh, show uh, the not does not go uh, they do not go too deep into the topic but they show uh, show you nice insights about uh, those protocols and then we have application layer protocols so dns that conrad already mentioned we we are quite often fighting with uh, dns uh, re records and when you are aware uh, what what type of records we can expect in dns what's the dns hierarchy and uh, how those DNS servers communicate communicate with each other, uh, you, it will be easier for you to, for instance, understand the network infrastructure of uh, your environment. So, for example, see how the load balancers are configured, what are the edge point, uh, endpoints, and and so on. Mm -hmm. And HTTP and TLS, I don't think I need to convince you that those protocols are very important. HTTP uh, almost most of the applications, uh, web applications, and uh, actually networking applications are using HTTP. And, uh, t and uh, currently, TLS is also a crucial part of the uh, HTTP, as uh, we almost always prefer to use HTTPS over HTTP. And uh, <clears throat> for example, for TLS, uh, you, uh, when you, you it, it's, when you're uh, when you know what uh, how the TLS frame is built, uh, you will be able to answer the question whether the, for example, host name is encrypted or not. Can you can you find it in the network trace or it will be encrypted? What what can you find? And uh, based on that knowledge, you will know that uh, using any uh, tracing tools that actually I'm going to mention in just a moment, uh, that you will know. Uh, whether it's worth to use, uh, for example, TCP dump, or you should rather use logs coming from the .NET application, so uh, sorry, from the .NET runtime, so something that will be um, will contain more information because .NET has the encrypted data. And if you run TCP dump without 
any additional keys uh, that were used uh, during the TLS handshake, then you probably just find garbage. That, uh, not really garbage for other applications, not garbage, but for you, it will be garbage because those will be only hex, uh, hexadecimals that you can do anything with because you'll be just a, a, a watcher, an attacker of a protocol. So <laughs> TLS is safe uh, to use because it's not possible to re decrypt the bytes without the, without the keys. And I mentioned TCP dump, but we also have Wireshark. And um, learning those tools is also great because when you uh, can see the uh, data frames from the protocol, uh, you, <clears throat> uh, that's, I, in my opinion, it's one of the best way, uh, ways to learn uh, about the protocol by using uh, one of those tracing tools. Wireshark has lots of dissectors for various protocols. So even if you have an unknown to you protocol, uh, but you collected the network trace of it, then uh, Wireshark could be able to de 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 decipher the, the, net, uh, the protocol frames and uh, show it to you. So you can uh, see them in a structured uh, format and then read about those par particular frames uh, that, uh, somewhere in the doc protocol documentation. So uh, the basic knowledge of protocols that your application uses, so uh, I already mentioned Samba, there could be Kerberos or other protocols, uh, as you know, there are many of them. Uh, the basic knowledge is also important because it might, it will help you in the future when uh, the, there will be a, a problem in the production and you will ask an administrator or maybe you will have access, uh, you will uh, gather the network trace and if you know the protocol, you will quickly find the uh, the points uh, where which looked problematic or uh, the frames which uh, uh, contain the important data. Those times when analyzing Kerberos, not authenticating <laughs> IIS users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kerberos is, uh, it could be, could be hard, but not, oh, not only Kerberos, oh, now, nowadays it's old, which oh. uh, could also provide a lot of various issues or uh, some, if you have, if you have uh, uh, maybe experienced troubleshooting some and those XMLs, which are encoded and you need to decode them. It, it's oh. of course, it's possible, but uh, when you have when you decode the frames, you will see those error messages that are returned from the server. And that uh, can sounds like everything. fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, okay, now we are moving to the very important point, which is a debugger. So <laughs> uh, I consider debugger one of the, uh, for me, I think it's the most important tool that I uh, use nowadays whenever I need to troubleshoot a problem. I might be biased and some people probably prefer tracers, but uh, debugger is a uh, so important tool to me that I, uh, when I see a problem, I usually jump into the debugger and start debugging. And only then if I find, okay, it's not, it probably it's uh, something bigger, uh, I need have to have a bigger picture, then I switch to trace and uh, use other tools, monitoring tools to first uh, learn about uh, uh, the, the um, uh, to have a bigger image of what's going on. But when it comes to the debugger, uh, on Windows, uh, I recommend learning WinDBG uh, and on Linux, either GDB or LLDB. For, uh, from a, for a .NET developer, LLDB will be probably a better, although G GDB is uh, more popular. So if you, if you use uh, uh, Linux uh, as your base system, you probably know already GDB. And um, uh, um, so, but when you need to debug .NET and uh, then LLDB, uh, you just have to know some basic commands for LLDB uh, to be able to load the source extension. And uh, so the basic uh, um, commands are how to use the debugger. So what, what it can provide. And I just mentioned uh, starting uh, a process under a debugger, attaching to a running process, opening a memory dump. But all, um, those uh, debuggers have uh, some special functions. So for example, in WinDBG, and I think also GDB has uh, not not internally, but uh, there there are additional tools which can give you this information. Uh, the the and I'm talking about the time travel debugging. So that that's a sort of a new way uh, uh, and great way of uh, debugging applications. 
So that's also a feature which I hope will become more and more popular and uh, we finally will be able to copy paste WinDBG on the production system and use the time travel debugging. Right now it's a bit more complicated, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. And when it comes uh, to debugging, uh, debugging symbols are uh, very important because without them, you will just see bytes and it will be like looking at the encrypted protocol that uh, I just uh, talked about a moment ago. So with uh, the debugging symbols, you are able to uh, decrypt, <laughs> not really decrypt, but decode the uh, call stacks and uh, uh, variables, uh, find the places in the code which <clears throat> where to put breakpoints and so on. So, and unfortunately, again, each operating system has different ways of uh, collect, uh, storing these debug informations. And uh, on some systems could be, it could be harder, like uh, some Linux distribution might not provide uh, the debug packages for uh, the uh, uh, binary packages. But for, uh, fortunately, most of them currently uh, do that. So for example, if you have Ubuntu or Debian or Arch Linux recently, uh, they, uh, they all uh, provide the uh, debug packages in the repository. On Windows, uh, it's, there's one vendor providing <coughs> uh, Windows binaries. So uh, uh, it's, it's more um, standard, uh, standardized, um, actually not standardized, but uh, it's in one place. And uh, we have those public symbol server that uh, Microsoft provides, which we can use anywhere when we have an, an internet access and uh, we can download the symbols uh, in the debugger. And when, uh, when we are in the debugger, those are the commands that I find, that's the basic amount of commands that we need to uh, know. And uh, uh, if you haven't heard about it, we, uh, Conrad uh, created a poster based on uh, some slides from the uh, Diagnostics Expert course that I uh, 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 recorded. And uh, uh, on this poster, Conrad put lots of various commands, uh, which, uh, um, and <laughs> all the commands that I mentioned here are also there. And those are for WinDBG and LLDB. So if you do not have it, go to goodies, uh, uh, dot, uh, dot net as org and download the, the poster and uh, have it somewhere uh, as a cheat sheet. And uh, <clears throat> But the commands that are I find uh, the most important, so when you need to debug an application, just know how to switch between processes and threads, then uh, how to dump the call stack of a given uh, selected thread. So uh, when you select a thread, have a look at the call stack, iterate through uh, call stack frames, print the variables on those frames. Uh, you need to also know the commands for um, looking at the process memory and uh, uh, examining it. Then uh, setting break breakpoints, either the function breakpoints or the uh, breakpoints in the source code. Uh, and we also have uh, the commands for dumping the assembly code. So if you're familiar with assembly, and it, and again, it's not you don't need to be a reverse engineer. You just need to know the basic, the basics like uh, what are the jump instructions, what is the call instruction. So, for example, if you even have a, a fundamental knowledge of assembly, you will see the calls that are being made in a in a function, and uh, you will be able to at least find the places and correlate them with uh, the source code that you have. So you will uh, you will find uh, you you will be able to find yourself in the assembly. And uh, finally, uh, it's uh, very important to know how to break uh, into the debugger when uh, an a, a, an exception happens, and not only unhandled exception, but uh, also the first chance exception, so at the moment when uh, the, there is a throw statement. And uh, so you will land in the exact place when the exception is thrown. And on Linux, we also have signals. So it's uh, when, uh, when in the debugger, uh, <clears throat> many informations on Linux are passed through signals. So for example, some faulty state could be uh, uh, reported by an application uh, by using a, a signal. And uh, it is possible in either GDB or LLDB to stop when a given uh, signal happens. 
And uh, when we are debugging .NET, we need to uh, know the source. Uh, we need to know the commands from the source extension. Uh, so uh, that's the extension that I mentioned uh, when I was talking about LLDB because we have uh, source extensions for uh, source extension for LLDB and not for GDB. And of course, it works also with uh, WinDBG. And uh, when we are uh, in the debugger of our favorite uh, IDE, uh, then uh, it's I also I also um, consider that uh, and I also think that knowing the features of this debugger will help you a lot when you're troubleshooting this uh, local instance of the application. So when you are dealing with uh, an issue that you found on your local system and you are debugging through the application, then uh, just uh, know the features that, for example, the Visual Studio debugger has or the, or the Rider debugger uh, can provide. So for example, how to set breakpoints on not your code, but some external code or some runtime method uh, or some library method <clears throat> and how to decompile in, in the debugger and so on and so on. So that's the, the knowledge that's uh, really useful. And, and now uh, let's focus on the diagnostics tool belt. So uh, the, the tools that uh, you will use, that you will like and uh, um, and uh, that that will sort of that will be sort of your um, uh, portfolio. <laughs> I don't know how to call it, but uh, uh, every I guess that every troubleshooter has these sort of tools that uh, um, are very useful. And uh, so, how to find those tools? So, read blogs, tweet, watch videos covering diagnostics topics, train. Uh, take trainings uh, they uh, those materials often contains interesting tools shown by others and uh, those people uh, the, the presenters will also show how to use those tools so when you when you find this new tool and you look at it and you think oh that that looks interesting i could it could be helpful for my scenarios then download it play with it so uh, you know use it for uh, some troubleshooting and uh, make notes. And that's really important. Make notes to yourself how you use this tool. What was the output? What were the issues that you found? And uh, the interesting comments in this uh, tool that uh, help you or uh, that you found useful and that you might uh, find useful in the future. Uh, then I uh, create a folder uh, for those diagnostics tools. Of course, if they are copy, uh, send along. Uh, if they are installed in the system, then you won't have them in your own folder, but you will just need to install them. So that probably applies to most of the uh, tools on Linux, but uh, on Windows, uh, I like to have my uh, diagnostics uh, tools folder, and I will show you it in just a moment. And uh, uh, also, uh, when we have the tools, we might also need some diagnostic scripts or configurations. I already mentioned PowerShell, but uh, uh, some of the tools have different ways of configurations or might use different script syntax and so on. So with time, you will probably collect those various uh, uh, plugins uh, and instructions and, and uh, those materials that uh, will uh, make um, uh, using of the tool uh, better. So let me switch for just a moment to uh, Total Commander. So that's one of the tools that I really love and use very often. I have many shortcuts here. So for example, I have this uh, Alt D command configured when I uh, those underscores here, I, I use, for example, I type Alt D then M and it jumps to my user profile folder. So the me user is, is uh, my user and I quickly can jump to this folder. I have many of them actually uh, 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 configured here. So for example, the my drive or Sparkle Share is the old name. I used to uh, use Sparkle Share to synchronize files between my systems, uh, but now I switch to SyncFink, which is uh, much better, but the name stayed. So I have Sparkle Share and then tools. And so that's my um, tool belt, and I collected those tools uh, through many years. Uh, and uh, there, I, some of them were deleted, some of them I no longer use, but I still keep them. Uh, so the bin folder is in the path folder, as well as DIAC, which is uh, for diagnostics tools. And to, to this one, I will probably um, uh, spend most time uh, in, uh, in just a moment. Then I have sysinternals, of course, that the whole sysinternals suite uh, that's uh, 
that I also have in path, so I can easily access them. And here I have Process Hacker, RPC Viewer, some uh, tools for uh, looking at the uh, COM information inside the registry and also a CPU-Z for uh, showing the hardware information. And in the DIAC tool, those are the tools for troubleshooting that I collected uh, uh, <laughs> uh, during the, 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 the many years of troubleshooting. Uh, and uh, of course, not all of them I use uh, daily, but uh, for example, I have debugging tools for Windows. Uh, I do not have WinDBG here because it was moved to uh, Windows Kits and the debugger, so I do no longer copy it, but I still keep extensions in this folder. So uh, here I have all the extensions that I found uh, for uh, WinDBG. So I, when I'm moving to some other system, I always copy this folder, so I have it at hand with WinDBG. So for example, this PDE extension uh, uh, from the Diffract tools show, and uh, there is also Next extension that Microsoft published. I have my own extension and uh, many others that uh, that are find, I find very helpful. I also have uh, the for the um, Windows Performance Toolkit, uh, I have the profiles uh, configured. I, I do not use uh, VPR too often, VPA actually too often, VPT, sorry, too often. Uh, I prefer Perfue, but still I have some scripts that um, I used in the production systems because they are very lightweight and <clears throat> Uh, I can use them to collect CPU information or uh, or uh, I/O uh, traces and so on. So that's that's uh, uh, that's how, how I uh, <laughs> that's how I build my my uh, tools folder. And of course, the, uh, the that that's the, the the structure of this for the folder is very personal. So we will probably uh, collect the tools in a different way, uh, but. Uh, uh, I, I just want to mention that having this folder is really helpful. And uh, it um, right now it probably has uh, like one gigabyte or maybe even more, but uh, uh, it's still uh, manageable and it's possible to copy all the tools on the USB drive, for example, and go to another computer and diagnose it or just zip them and copy them to some server. So you have all your uh, tools available in your uh, troubleshooting session. Uh, so that's that's about the tools. Now let's move on to the uh, uh, information and uh, how to uh, how to gather them and search through them. Uh, and again, that's very personal. And I will just show you a few um, ways how I uh, use the the, the maybe sites that I often use and I really like, and the way how I use it. Uh, use them. So I, as you maybe noticed, this Firefox uh, profile is uh, quite empty. <laughs> they, it does not contain many uh, my usual bookmarks, but I added the ones that I want to show you. So each browser, uh, main browsers, so Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and uh, I'm not sure about others, but those provide something which is called uh, uh, maybe differently in, in uh, uh, Chrome or Edge, but there's something uh, like a search keyword. And uh, on uh, in Firefox, we can configure this percent as string as the one that will be passed if we place anything after the command. So I have a bunch of uh, a search engines configured in this way. So for example, I can type man ps and that jumps me to uh, the search uh, page of the man 7 org, which I find really great for um, uh, uh, searching the ma uh, Linux manuals, they are updated, and the, uh, uh, Michael Karisk, uh, the guy who is responsible for it, he's also the <clears throat> the author of this great book, which I'm going to mention in, in, at the end of the presentation. And he's also one of the people responsible for updating Linux manual pages. So this site is great, and uh, it contains lots of uh, commands, Linux commands, and it's really easy to search through it if I just type my. Uh, then I also have TLDR. So for example, if I type TLDR DS, then uh, I have this summary of the commands. And uh, I also have .NET, of course, .NET source code. So if I type .NET and let's say uh, create process, uh, 
I will jump uh, right into the source.net with, uh, 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 with various places where uh, create process was used. And um, I also uh, 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 really like the, uh, the uh, tool uh, by Julia Evans, which is a DNS lookup. And uh, so if I need to search for uh, uh, a site, the DNS records for a site, I just type DNS and then it goes to DNS lookups and I can look through the various records. And uh, of course we can add uh, various domains here. So for .netos, we can see what re records they uh, configured and <clears throat> what are their mailing servers. We can see that they are using Google Workspace and, and so on. Uh, so uh, that's the, uh, the browser search engines are great and, uh, uh, and I, I like to use them. And uh, we also have um, the source um, code engines and I also use them very often when I uh, want to know, uh, for example, how a given method was used that I found, or maybe I'm looking for uh, a usage, um, uh, us usages of a given a library, I have a, a keyword configured SRC. And if I type, okay, I, I will be, I won't be very uh, innovative here, Q create process W, then I can find the source graph looks for the repositories on GitHub and <clears throat> Uh, other places and uh, looks for instances for create process W. And of course, I could also search uh, GitHub, which I quite often do, but uh, I do that through the bank uh, GH. Uh, that's uh, as I'm using DuckDuckGo as a search engine, then it, ha it has those uh, nice uh, features of with the bank. Uh, so shortcuts to use a different search engine and it redirect di redirects me uh, to a given page. And uh, additionally, I have some special PowerShell scripts, which uh, I uh, use to search through the local folders on my system. So for example, when I want to look through the um, Windows headers, I have the uh, search win headers uh, command, which is under the hood using RG, uh, so uh, uh, grep on steroids. Uh, and let's, uh, okay, let's again look for create process W. And uh, you will see that um, the first search will be a bit slower because the, the, uh, the those pages uh, of the file system were probably not cached, but it's still very fast. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it's usually quite fast and we can easily find the definitions in various uh, header files and uh, mm, locate them. So you see that this script is really uh, short and I have, uh, uh, multiple scripts like that. So for example, we have a script to uh, look through the uh, Visual Studio uh, source codes uh, and those are for uh, mm, ATL and MFC and uh, C++ runtime. So if I want to search for some um, function uh, and, and uh, the, its definition, I just, okay, but the, the, this one will, the, wasn't the, the very best choice, but uh, we can use the, I can use this command to uh, search through uh, the files uh, provided with Visual Studio. Uh, next point is about maybe more about the approach to troubleshooting than uh, uh, about the specific toolkits. So uh, we need to be curious and patient. And um, yeah, so uh, when we are when we are starting troubleshooting, we should always collect as much information as you uh, as we can. So ask questions. Uh, what were the, the exact symptoms? Uh, was there a change to the code system that usually provides some uh, you know, the, the, uh, some guidance, what could go wrong. Then normally when the system is working, then uh, when there are no changes to the system, the, except the, the, the issue should not uh, appear unless there is some hardware uh, error. And um, uh, the very important part is reproducing. And uh, when we can reproduce the problem in multiple steps, then we, sh we should try to um, narrow it. So make the steps, um, make the number of steps smaller and uh, just um, uh, keep them limited. And we shouldn't jump to conclusions. So we shouldn't uh, have, uh, um, uh, we, we, we shouldn't uh, think of what's the 
the the cause of the problem too quickly because uh, that's uh, that's usually the problem of or, or that's usually also a problem. Let let it. Uh, let, I mean, give yourself some time to swallow the evidence that you have and uh, prove that the, the 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 cause of the issue is actually the one that uh, you think of. Uh, and some issues can be resolved in one session, especially, especially the bigger ones, the most pro the more problematic ones. So give yourself a break, take a walk, go even go sleep, and you will find that you know this this uh, this break helped you a lot. Uh, next day you will have fresh mind, new ideas how to approach the problem, and maybe even you will find <clears throat> a gap in your understanding. So something that you missed, but uh, it was there. And uh, after resolving an issue, it's quite important to understand why it happened and why your solution worked. Uh, I, um, I often found, uh, I often saw people which were, uh, when, when they found a, a solution and the, the issue was no, no more longer appearing, they actually didn't make this additional effort to make sure that they understand why this solution work. Because sometimes it's just a workaround, so we switch a different way, and we didn't understand the uh, the, the, the exact problem. So, for example, uh, when let's pick an, uh, an, uh, an, as an example a SQL query, which we run and it runs slow, uh, sometimes uh, the the the, uh, the approach is okay. Let's create an index and let's add an additional index. And we we don't think about the trade off So, for example, creating this additional e index will slow down the updates to the to a given table, and it might cause other problems because maybe the backup will be slower or or something like that. So. Uh, in the first place, we should understand why this query is slow. Maybe we could make it faster by simply uh, changing the uh, the way how uh, the query is built. So look at the query plan, find the places which are slow in the query plan, and then first try to modify the query to maybe use the uh, indexes which are already in the database, and then <clears throat> uh, then uh, and only after that, when you understand the problem, only then. Uh, try to create a new index as a solution because now you are sure that the solution will work because well there's a missing index in the uh, in the database and you just prove it and even if you abandon a project uh, sorry a troubleshooting session you find a workaround uh, leave the notes and let them stay for some time so uh, maybe with time you gain some experience with a given uh, part of the system and you will be able to get back to this problem and uh, look at the logs that you collected and maybe you will be able to reproduce it and uh, find a solution to it. That happened to me uh, in the past and that's why uh, uh, the next uh, slide is about nodes and uh, the, um, why they are important. And <clears throat> uh, uh, I won't. Con I don't want to convince you of one way to collecting nodes. That's always a de debate, <laughs> which tool is better for collecting nodes, and everyone probably has a uh, uh, some preference to it. And I already used several various systems. Now, I'm, now I'm, I switch to Markdown uh, files, which I just uh, keep um, in a. a, a St structured form. So, the, but the important uh, points are that we need to document the steps that we are taking uh, and the findings in the trace files, logs, memory dumps. So, extract the information that you found in the logs, uh, put the date on the notes. So, maybe the tool is doing for you uh, that automatically. But uh, when you uh, when you have the dates with the actions that you take, you will see the sequence of events that the sequence of actions that you take, the the um, your um, the, the, your reasoning uh, for taking those steps. So you will see why uh, why a given um, why you picked a given uh, way of thinking, and maybe you will find it faulty later. But uh, it's not important. Important is that. Uh, you will see what you did already, and by scanning through the nodes, you will uh, uh, find the places that you already visited, uh, even you know a week after a problem. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I already said that, but after finding the solution or even giving up, uh, giving up, 
complete the notes. So make sure that they will be readable to you in the future because your future self will thank yourself when uh, you read the, the summary of uh, a given issue <clears throat> when it happens again. So you will, you know, you will, uh, there will be some place in your mind that, oh, okay, I think I saw it already. And then you look, you uh, uh, search through your notes because you have them indexed <laughs> and searchable. So you search through the notes and you find, uh, you find them, but you know, if they are uh, in a form uh, that was readable to you at the time when you were diagnosing, diagnosing it probably won't be readable to you after a few months or even a few weeks. You you'll just won't find yourself in those yeah, notes. Yeah. There, there's no worse feeling that this feeling <laughs> that you know that you have solved this issue previously, but you have not written down anything, and you start to Google exact the same pages and exactly <laughs> look exactly, exactly through the same problems. That's really really not welcome uh, painful yeah <laughs> and i want to show you the way how i structure my notes it's, it's not my actual research folder because i have a bunch of uh, work items there that i can't really share but uh, i usually for e for each year <laughs> i create a research folder and i archive the ones that i um when they said the at the end of the year i i just copy the folder so i start empty that helps me that helps free my mind from the things that uh, i haven't completed or uh, the things that maybe i shouldn't complete and the projects that i'm currently working on for so for example there is the rpc feature that is coming to WeTrace. <clears throat> I collect some docs, documentations that I found in the internet. Then I place notes, as I said, in Markdown, where I put some uh, uh, <clears throat> things that I did on a given day. And with the title, it's usually better, but here the file name is not very helpful. Uh, and then I have also traces and logs that I collected during the sessions, also with dates, so I can correlate them with notes. And I have uh, always add uh, links. Uh, uh, MD file where I place links uh, links uh, to interesting articles on a given subject. And when I complete a given task, I move it to completed. Then I have notes. So those, those are the notes that I keep because I use those commands often and <laughs> I just need to have a reference. Uh, so those are just cheat sheets actually <clears throat> for those various tools. Then I have the abandoned folder, <laughs> which you can guess what I used for. And uh, I have also planned, so that's, for example, .NET Wix trace, so UI for .NET, .NET Wix trace. And I have snippets. So that snippets is just a folder when I place uh, code that for uh, different parts of framework that I might use in the future. Most of the files for .NET are, are in the Linkopad format. And there are, uh, for example, F-sharp version and C-sharp version. That's for cryptography. Then I have some uh, 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 various commands for using .NET uh, the, the react reactive uh, code and, and so on. So as you can see, there are a bunch of them. For C++, I also have uh, various ways for <laughs> various files that I have. And uh, <clears throat> for the binary editor, I have some templates that I also use. So look look very ones. inspiring. Like it is super, <laughs> super great approach to have this structure structured way of taking notes and you i believe it's super valuable to have something like that you, you have something to return to uh, yeah. even after a year yeah. or two you will know that it will be there yeah uh, i i'm yeah, trying exactly. to do that uh, and i have failed a few times because typically it ends with few sources of truth so i have some notes here some notes here and some notes there and that's really a problem because then I really don't know where to, to look, yeah, look yeah. for. I, I went through that. Yeah, I went yeah, through that. So... This system I have for, uh, I think, four, four years already. That's my archive. Yeah. I, I, I was improving it. So, for example, there are completed here uh, from the last year and there are many links <laughs> so in general uh, instead of relying on any super awesome tool or online take noting tool or anything else you just have ended with uh, folders and markdown files yeah yeah exactly i ended but up at least with you have you know it is there and it totally yeah everything is here exactly you synchronize it somehow through 
various PCs. Yes, I use I use SyncFing for that oh, because there okay. there are, I don't want to put them on OneDrive. There are some private information here, for example, or also they are, they there could be memory dumps here. Mm -hmm. And when I synchronize them between the Linux server, when I run SyncFing, and then I have a Surface, for example, then all those files are synchronized and. Awesome. SyncFink is great. I really and, recommend uh, it. SyncFink is something that is running P2 to peer, peer to peer. peer. Yeah, yeah, with between your nodes. Pieces, right? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. Nice. So they can they can uh, communicate and synchronize between them. So that's uh, that's a great tool. I, I really I'm so <laughs> I'm so happy about using it that uh, <laughs> wow. I I'm not looking for anything else. That's actually my OneDrive <laughs> in my local network. Uh, Okay, so that, that 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 was about notes, <clears throat> and uh, the last point I want to mention is about the publishing. What you find, and the, the reason why I uh, tell that, I know that not everyone uh, feels comfortable about making presentations to the public or making uh, writing blog posts. I completely understand that. But the point is that when you um, explain a problem uh, to someone else, you will find. Uh, <laughs> you will learn a lot and you will find gaps in your understanding. You will uh, find new questions that you need to answer. So doing that is very helpful. Even preparing a presentation for your internal team, even if you don't, will not present it at the end, will help you because it will, um, uh, that's actually, if you, if you make good notes, that's also uh, something that, uh, I will it might give similar results because uh, when you when you're writing down uh, the the um, uh, you're writing down the steps that you took the uh, the ways that you took uh, you will find uh, uh, that okay I, but, I, but I haven't really understand why I did that and then you you will start uh, thinking about it and maybe you will find the part. Uh, uh, in the in the system that you don't really understand that you might need to learn about it so that's that's uh, very helpful I find myself uh, um, uh, for example as in in my experience when uh, I, I learn a lot when I'm writing a blog post I do that I don't do that too often because that takes it takes me a lot of time but uh, I really learn, I learn a lot. Like I spent weeks uh, when I when I think of a blog post, for example, for recently I published something for Com, and when I started writing about it, I was right. Uh, I was already developing Com code, but when I started writing a blog post, uh, the blog post which I thought will take me uh, two days finally ended up taking four weeks. Of course, not, not all the time, but <laughs> it was many hours spent in the debugger uh, to uh, make sure that actually I understand what's going on there. So <laughs> uh, that's an extreme, but um, I just want to say that making a presentation or a blog post is a great way to organize knowledge and uh, fill the gaps. And uh, also another reason for doing that is that uh, we might, um, thanks to the blog post or the presentation, we might uh, be a part of interesting discussions that uh, might be triggered by this um, uh, blog post. So uh, that's that's also a benefit of sharing your knowledge with others and uh, uh, well, talking about it. And the last slide is about my favorite diagnostics books. And uh, um, so uh, I'm more of a reader than um, a video, video consumer. That's why I mentioned books. Uh, so for Windows, we have win advanced Windows debugging, then inside Windows debugging, great books about Windows. And of course, Windows internals, which is heavy to read. And but uh, uh, it's quite detailed and uh, it discusses uh, various parts of the system. So you won't probably read it uh, cover to cover, but rather uh, specific chapters or even parts of the chapters. And recently, Pavel Yosefovich published uh, Windows 10 system pro programming. So when you're developing a, a software on Windows, then uh, it's a really uh, interesting and updated uh, book uh, on um, the system API, so the ways how you can interact with them and the correct ways of calling uh, various system uh, methods. On Linux, we have systems performance and BPF performance tools. Those are uh, 
quite new books. I think they were published a year or two years ago at the maximum. So they are quite fresh and they cover um, the many uh, troubleshooting tools on Linux. Uh, the Brendan uh, also published these uh, interesting videos and articles, the 60 seconds of troubleshooting, uh, when he presents various um, um, uh, tools for, for the, the quick uh, troubleshooting of a failing system. Uh, then we have the Linux programming interface, which is uh, a book uh, covering the system API of Linux. And uh, in this way, it's similar to this Windows 10 system programming by Pavel. Uh, and uh, this book is written by Michael Karisk, so the guy responsible for the Linux manual. It's a really great book if you want to write um, uh, software on Linux. And uh, and finally, we have uh, uh, the .NET books. And the first one I want to mention is the Pro.NET Memory Management by Conrad. Uh, as you know, a very big book <laughs> to read, but uh, also probably not cover to cover, but uh, it's, it's very detailed and contains lots of uh, uh, great um, uh, insights on uh, .NET runtime. Then we have a bit uh, dated, but still valuable advanced .NET debugging book by, by Mario Huard and a CLR via C Sharp, which is also a bit dated, but I remember that this book was the one uh, sort of an eye opener for me when I was uh, starting my uh, uh, journey into .NET. So that's that's it for uh, for today. Ah, of course, I recommend also uh, taking the diagnostics expert course. Uh, I cover most of the the, the uh, subjects that I mentioned today. They are also in the course. That's the reason why I put them in the course actually, because that's that's uh, the experience that I had and uh, the, the the topics that I found most valuable uh, to become a good troubleshooter. So that's it. Thank you. And um, let's let's uh, uh, maybe uh, answer questions. If, uh, thank you. Thank you. A, a lot of uh, topics. Like it seems that being a diagnoser requires a lot of super wide knowledge, or we should say high knowledge, because we need to go from the lowest levels up to the highest levels this makes also it super tempting like you are not sticking to the let's say front end or database but it really requires to have this very wide look at everything because then you don't know in the end what is the reason of particular problem maybe it is in operating system maybe on network maybe in the runtime maybe in your app so you need to just be ready to analyze and understand all those levels yeah exactly that, that that's super tempting like i remember myself promising myself a few years ago i want to understand the whole stack from uh, the bottom up to the highest levels just you no know, it is trivial maybe but do do how many people in the end understand what is happening when you access a site uh, so that you access it via HTTP, what does HTTP is really doing, what is the DNS and, uh, and the, the lowest levels of network and then uh, ah, a lot of talking. So um, I really like it that it is for, I believe being a good diagnoser is for those people that really like to dig in, really like to learn because we should be prepared for learning a lot in all those areas. Uh, but some of them really like doing this. So this is really... Yeah, it becomes an adventure after it. Yeah, so. and then, then, then there's an adventure and then you have a problem at hand and you need to solve it. So um, it is a mix of knowledge, intuition, and also those skills, like you mentioned this slide, uh, I probably cannot emphasize enough the importance of this approach that you need to uh, look at the problem, don't have any kind of confirmation bias that it is for sure a memory leak. You need to have some hypothesis, validate, recheck, trade maybe something different, sleep with the problem, that's super important. Like uh, you walk. can walk. Yes, and walk, <laughs> exactly. Because uh, so that's really, if, if someone likes challenges, being such diagnoser is really 
like great specialization like if you are even maybe you have enough regular programming then that's for sure something that may be really challenging uh, for sure a lot of knowledge also to gather like we saw only those books that you have mentioned is like weeks of reading but you don't need to read them from as you said from cover to cover you can touch this topic that topic so that's super awesome uh okay that was my few words about it i just believe it may be really really nice specialization to be an expert diagnoser you don't have to earn money from it you can be just this guy that knows and will help to solve some problems in your company and that's super beneficial also I'm looking through the questions and uh, regarding the information that in Kenya currently there are thunderstorms, which is uh, nice information. We have we don't have snow, but we are oh, really windy. windy. Yeah, exactly. Strong wind. So we, we have problem with that. We have already answered that this presentation will be published. Uh, we will link it here in the description of the video. Also, I linked the discord and we will be publishing it there uh, there there was an information from conrad that it she, he sorry is surprised that powershell is on linux oh i used it on linux also yeah it's it it is not that uh, uh, uh the, the only problem i found with it is that you might miss some system commands they are not yet ported but mm. uh, it works <laughs> dot net works so. <laughs> so it starts to be mind-blowing like you can have linux on windows using powershell and in the end you really don't know where you are which is nice yeah. like everything is is connected also is the side note that console.write as always printing hello one hello two hello three it's uh, the the one of the probably still best tools we could use in the ad hoc analysis too and uh, the th the question like the real question is uh, how would you proceed to debug a performance issue with dotnet and entity framework so a uh, general approach and uh, ideas well, <laughs> it's so general, qu generic question. So I would just say that you need to go with .NET Trace or Purview and just collect the trace. And the performance issue is almost always uh, uh, it, to diagnose the performance issue is always best, almost always best to use the tracing tool. So yeah. I will go with it and then check currently, this. currently .NET Trace has this profile for databases so you can get some logs from there we have very f initial knowledge but also the question is what it does really mean to have a performance issue related with entity framework because it sounds like the saddest possible thing like not optimal sql query being produced so then probably you need to look what sql queries are produced and to use and so on so uh, that does a definitely big topic like <laughs> A, a separate presentation. Yeah, separate presentation. And also covered in the course, as far as I remember. That yeah, was a yeah. few, few months ago. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so that's all. We don't have more questions. Uh, while slowly closing the talk, you have still some time to, more, to ask the very last one questions. Uh, for me, it was super nice uh, overview of what it does really mean to be diagnoser and what skill set you can have. I believe this talk may be really nice for uh, just giving people, okay, someone will ask me, I'm thinking about changing my specialization a little bit. Uh, so then I can provide this video and uh, it will uh, give kind of overview what is what it is to be a diagnoser and what do you need to know which is a lot but a very nice thing uh, okay maybe we could just slowly end i'm not sure maybe maybe your any final words to 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 say before <laughs> you end oh i already talked a lot <laughs>
that's true. <laughs> no, I will, I will only say that it's it's worth the, the time spent. So I mm. highly recommend uh, uh, spending time on learning diagnostics. And even if you do not want to work in it, just do some um, research, uh, read some articles, and uh, take some trainings, book, read books, and uh, you will see that uh, it will help uh, in your daily development tasks. Yeah, exactly. It may it really may be helpful, even if we'll not start earn money from doing diagnostics. For sure, there will be a situation that you will have a bug and you will need to solve it somehow. So instead of just running and screaming, you will be able to to solve it somehow. By the way, I, it just reminded me that we have this uh, .NET of Essentials, which is just a set of few uh, lessons from various courses, and there are free lessons from your course. Course. So if someone is interested here, we, you have a link, you can just register for totally free course uh, and free sample lessons from you about Docker, about, Docker, about uh, I don't remember exactly, um, network traces and uh, production debugging in gen. So uh, kind of preview what you can and find. And also the symbols lesson, I think, available in oh, YouTube. On YouTube as a, as yeah. a free sample. Yeah, so free sample. even uh, from learning that, you have four hours uh, or three hours of content to, to take. Awesome. We don't have more questions. So after one hour, we probably can just end, not prolong it anymore. Thank you, Sebastian, for being with us. Thank you, everyone, Thank you, for being with us. Yeah. Uh, I hope you will have the nice rest of the day and see you somewhere on YouTube, on conferences. For sure, we will see somewhere else. So bye. bye. Thank you.